welcome everyone to the book club. Thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate everyone uh, who comes out to spend some time with us. This is a free meeting for all Pilates and movement enthusiasts sponsored by Pilatesology in partnership with Perspire Providence Pilates and Authentic Method Pilates. We hope that you'll find fresh inspiration for your workouts, some rest and relaxation, and some fun while reading and connecting with our community. Our next book is Cage Line by John Steele, uh, as we had to reschedule last month's book due to uh, emergency with the author. Um, but I hope you come and join us for that next month. And if you're here, you probably already know about Pilatesology, but for those who are not subscribers, it's an amazing resource for students and teachers where you can get unlimited streaming of classical Pilates for only $20 a month. If you've not already subscribed, I would highly recommend checking out their vast library of Pilates resources from some of the top teachers around the world. My name is Nabi and I'm the founder of Perspire. It's an iPhone app created for Pilates teachers uh, to help independent studios create amazing experiences for their clients and thrive in the ever-changing wellness market. It's free to download and use. And if you would like, I would love to personally give anyone a free demo and walk them through it if they're interested. Our moderator today is Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl Turnquist is a Power Pilates master teacher trainer and has studied Pilates since 1999. She is the proud owner of Providence Pilates Center in Providence, Rhode Island, which opened its doors in 2001. Cheryl had a stroke of genius to start a Pilates book club as another fun way for clients and teachers to connect over Pilates. And so that was the beginnings of our club today. Our author today is Wayne Curtis, who is an award-winning freelance journalist and has been a contributing editor at The Atlantic since 2005. He has also written for numerous magazines and papers, including The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bon App, Men's Journal, American Archaeology, and many, many more. Curtis has also contributed to the popular radio show, This American Life. Curtis published The Last Great Walk in 2014, and we are so happy to have him today to speak about his work and his research in writing the novel. So please welcome um, Wayne. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Cheryl quickly to do some housekeeping. Yeah, so if we could all just, um, except for Wayne and I, if everyone could go on mute, that would be helpful just from a background noise kind of standpoint. And um, since it's a small group, obviously this is being recorded because a lot of people do that watch this on recording afterwards. But as it's a small group, we can definitely allow for personal interaction more than if it was a larger group. So you can feel free to chat in the chat if you have a specific question while we're talking, or there's a raise your hand icon down below in the reactions and that will kind of pull you right up so we can see. Um, or if it just feels better to do one of these, you can always wave at us too. <laughs> we'll get a hold of you. Um, I want to thank Wayne for joining us today. Um, I know he's been on some travels. And um, thank you, Wayne, for taking the time to meet with us and, and discuss your book with us. I appreciate you being here. Sure. It's my, uh, my pleasure. Nice excuse to get a break from uh, doing liquor related stuff today. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I was looking at your bio that you're. Um, been writing some um, articles and um, I don't know if you had a book with it of, on spirits and um, uh, cocktails and different types. Is there a certain one that you are more privy to than others? The uh, the thing that started off in 2006, I, I wrote a book about the history of rum and the rum's role in the development of North America through the from the American Revolution through the slave trade through you know, popular culture in the present day. So that's got me started, but since then, I've been writing about different aspects, mostly pop culture and history of spirits and cocktails and bars. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, and I wonder, have you uh, found that COVID has changed anything from the uh, intake or anything like that of certain changed spirits? Every, changed everything. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, well, all the bars closed. So people started yeah. drinking at home or making drinks at home. I thought, today, I spent the day with a distiller in Denver and we were talking about what switched for him and he makes a lot of uh, obscure liqueurs uh, from, from apple and from raspberries. And he said those got popular, more popular Ooh. than before because people wanted to start making drinks at home with the right. spirits. So there was some right. change. Now yeah. the bars are opening, things are starting to get back to normal. But yeah, you know, whatever the new normal is gonna shape up. To be. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you started doing that in like 2006. What switched you over in 2014? Well, the book was published in 2014, but what switched you over to decide to write a book 
of this nature about the great, the last great walk. I found it so interesting on so many levels. It was, it was the, the book idea preceded my interest in writing about spirits. I think I probably was first interested in Edward Pace and Weston starting around 1990 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I came across a reference from him by accident. I was working on a story about a guy named James Finney Baxter, and I was going through microfilm in the basement of a of a uh, library. If anyone remembers microfilm, very slow, and painful process. You have to speed <laughs> ahead, stop, see what page you're on. And I happened to just hit on a page that was from 1909 about Edward Pace and Weston walking across the country. So I was a guy who was walking 35, 40 miles a day. He was going to do it from in 100 days. He was. Uh, 70 years old, and I thought, well, good for him. And I just kept scrolling ahead. Then I thought, wait a minute, what? And I went back and reread everything and started, I gathered a little bit of information. And then I had to go back to my actual research. But over the next 20 years or so, I would go every so often, I had some free time, I would go and research him. Uh, there was a gap of about five years. I almost forgot about him. And then I found some files and I looked online and discovered that there was this suddenly this new uh, Valhalla of research, all these scans, newspapers, and PDFs. And I punched his name in, and I think I came up with 1,200 articles about him. Uh, and I wow. realized well, now the research might be a little more feasible than it was 10, 15 years ago. So I just started reading all the articles I could about him, and the book sort of emerged out of there. I wasn't sure I wanted to write about that, but my wife at the time told me that I had to do it because because she was tired of me talking about him. And she said, get him out of your system. I thought he was a fascinating <laughs> guy. So that's well, a good he had a New England connection to. too. You and I have talked about earlier when we were on, you're, you have a connection to Maine and I'm in Rhode Island and Edward um, Pace, Pace and Weston was also a New Englander, New Englander right? Yeah. In the beginning. Um, I think what struck me so much was just like you said, his age. And I don't know, over COVID, I've taken to my husband and I will go for a walk every you know, evening after dinner or whatever, and we maybe make a mile and who that's our walk. And this, this man at 70 years old in March, which is really quite chilly still in winter weather, right. walked 40 miles a day, practically um, 10 to plus 10 to 15 hours a day, he walked. And I just, uh, the feasibility of that is blows my mind. I don't understand how he did it. I tried several times to, to do what I came to think of as a Weston which I thought is a, a unit of 35 miles. Um, I couldn't do it. I, I could get to, I think I can do about 21, 22 miles in a day and I'm just, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was a sort of an exceptional, exceptional specimen and just not only in his stamina, but also apparently he had a fairly wide uh, hip. So was, he didn't have chafing. And I think a lot of other people, uh, you get a few miles in, you start getting the chafing. I think uh, Weston was able to avoid the chafing, but he was studied pretty prolifically by doctors at the time. They would they would measure his intake and his output. Uh, I'll leave, leave that to your imagination, but they uh, to try to find out how he was processing nutrients and everything. He was sort of a marvel at the time, but he also was was pretty well grounded in that he saw walking. I think is the the way for people to stay healthy, and he disparaged automobiles. He, he disliked smoking. He thought that young kids or teenagers or young men, young women getting onto trolleys and trams was ridiculous when they could walk. Um, he, mm. he started walking clubs and tried to get people out walking and, you know, after his long walk when he was in his 70s and 80s. He was, he was, uh, he was pretty ahead of his time in a lot of ways. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, he was a bit of a, a huckster. You know, he, was, he knew how to hustle. He knew how to get, keep his name in print. He knew how to draw out crowds. Uh, he, when he started out his long walks, he would often you know, get sponsors, raincoat companies right. like to, to um, pay for his trips and he'd hand out flyers along the way. So he, he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. It sounds like he was one of those guys, from what I understood, you know, he had issues with money and then he'd make it up and then he'd have issues with right. money and then he'd figure it out. And it was kind of this pattern of his life, right? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I mean, walking was not, a, he was from a, I wouldn't say an aristocratic family, but a, uh, not a lower middle class. Mm -hmm. And walking, co walking competitions were huge in the 1870s. And it was typically one for, you know, Irish immigrants and other uh, lower on the socioeconomic uh, scale would compete in those. And he, he was a little 
his family was from from better stock they would have said back at the time and so mm -hmm. he would he would sort of compete but he dressed more flamboyantly i think just to distinguish himself so he didn't look like just a common pedestrian when he competed <laughs> so where you know, wear white sombreros and long coats and fancy boots when he did his walks. Um, so when you say a walking competition, would that be so I've never I had never thought of anything like that before. It's similar to what we would consider like a marathon or a half marathon. Would that be like the the revelry behind that? But they weren't running. They were walking instead. I think a, a marathon combined with the P.T. Barnum show, they were uh, <laughs> they were really there's a lot of betting that was involved in it. OK, so some of the early ones, I think his first one uh, his first one happened in 18, what was that, be 1862, I think, or, or maybe, maybe earlier than that. It was when it was, the bet was that he could walk to uh, he could walk to Washington, D.C. and make it there right. in time for Abraham Lincoln's inauguration. And he missed it by two hours. But it, right. it, it, um, it was a, you know, it was a, it, it kicked it off. People realized he was a walker, and I think he realized he could, he could hustle and make it a side job and then it turned out to making it a job but people would bet on him and then he you know you'd get sporting clubs so this was post-civil war you have to remember this was the peak of the sporting life uh mm -hmm. everybody was there it was baseball it was horse racing it was casino gambling uh there was all the big fancy saloons it was a interesting time a lot of that i think came out of the, the sort of macho culture from the civil war mm -hmm. soldiers might spend two years conscripted and of that two years, maybe they spent five or six days fighting, but a lot of time they just sat around in camps or moving from camp to camp. And they st stage all sorts of competitions amongst themselves and that sort of spilled over. So these sporting clubs would, would put up a wager that say we've got $5,000 that Weston can't walk from Portland, Maine to Chicago, Illinois in 30 days. And, and then they'd have sub wagers in there. And, and one of those was that, that within that we bet he can't do uh, three days where he exceeds, I think it was, uh, was it a hundred miles? I think it was a three 100 mile days that he had to do in it. And there were sort of sub bets on that. Uh, and it's obviously it's rife for corruption and fixing things. Is the, the, there were rumors that bet Weston worked with people who bet against him and he would throw the, the bets and things like that. I'm not sure if that was true, but it was, it was a big thing. Walking was a big thing. There were uh, six day, you know, go as you please races at Madison Square Garden in New York where it started at midnight on Sunday because nobody wanted to compete on the Sabbath day and uh it was whoever walked the farthest between midnight on Sunday to midnight the following Saturday they could walk they could run they could do whatever they want spectators would come into Madison Square Garden pay 25 or 50 cents to visit they had bands playing in the middle and they're selling food and people just walk people walk around a track walk around they had little tents. oh my god so that they could slip into the tent and sleep for an hour or two and then get up and keep walking and just see how far they could go. And uh, a Oh, wow. Night. This was all late 19th century. It was, uh, but I'm also thinking, like, what kind of shoes did they wear? They didn't have their Hoka ones on or their Nikes. Like, they were probably wearing really hard. What were they uh, wearing? Bare feet? No, they were uh, they wore heavy boots. Weston wore heavy wow. boots. I think some others had some lighter ones. But Weston had, uh, had boots. His boots custom made. He even provided the uh, cow for the leather because he was convinced his competitors was going, were going to sabotage his boots somehow. So he was very oh. secretive about his boots. And uh, yeah, he uh, he uh, he walked in big heavy boots. He he had he had uh, he he would pour whiskey down his boots to for to he believe that prevented blisters. So oh. uh, he would always have a flask of whiskey. One of his his support people behind him. Would, he would toot the whistle and then come up with his whiskey and pour it down his boots just to keep his feet. I don't know what that, I, I did not try that. I Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> see if that makes it work. That whiskey has a lot of purposes, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I love um, the, the way the book reads where you're giving a you know chronology of his walk and, and into his personal life with the walk. And then it segues into like a theme. The, be the, the one that struck me the most was the Lazy Boy um, factory and museum. Um, and I think the last kind of parting word was that we were kind of, um, the only word I can think of is like getting sucked up and enveloped by our chairs. Because um, as movement practitioners that a lot of us on the call here are, um, you know, it's such a part of our life. And when COVID hit, I found myself in my chair, 10 hours a day teaching in my chair. And that phrase just struck me like I'm being sucked in by my chair. 
Can you talk a little bit about the, the, you know, the, the pros and the cons? This book was so much about that we've lost our joy of walking. We've lost our upright bipedalism and, and how that's affecting us physically and mentally, but physically first, maybe. Right. Now that, that was when I started the book, I, I thought it would be just entirely about Weston, just a narrative about his hike, his walk. But the more I read about it, the more I realized there, there wasn't that much because he did not give, I never found any diaries. I contacted his great granddaughter and see if there were any diaries. I don't think he kept one. He didn't seem to be very introspective. He seemed to like attention. Um, that seemed to be a lot of the motivation for him. So I was looking for other aspects. One of the aspects that struck me right from the beginning was that there were these huge crowds that came out to see him everywhere he went. There was something like 10,000 that saw him off in New York, probably an equal number that saw him arrive in San Francisco. Even small towns that he would show up, people would line up for a mile outside of town just to watch him walk by. Probably a test to how boring things were in America in 1909. <laughs> you go stand out in the cold just to walk somebody walk by. But he was a he was a real you know a real celebrity. And I was sort of fascinated by the fact that he could draw these crowds and that all the newspapers covered him and the fact that there were 1,200 stories about him uh, walking cross country. It was it, that grew fascinating. I was like sort of like, what was happening in 1909 that would have drawn out all these crowds. And so I started looking and realized that was really when the automobile uh, started to appear. It was when the Henry Ford was really going to the uh, assembly line. It was when uh, Lots was going. There was the first race of the uh, Indianapolis 500 was in 1909. The okay. Wright brothers, we started getting airplane flights happening uh, in 1909. So, and then he had uh, uh, Marchetti, uh, who was uh, wrote the Futurist Manifesto. And he, his whole thing was slowness is something of the past, speed is of the future. And he sort of had a, a lot of followers on that. And I just sort of felt like 1909 was sort of a turning point. So that's why I called the book The Last Great Walk. And I realized we evolved as humans for two and a half million years to walk. We walk well. It's extremely energy efficient. Uh, you know, I think people are frustrated that they don't burn more calories when they walk because we evolved not to uh, do that. We evolved to do it with minimal energy consumption. But it's it's a it's a remarkable thing. And I started wondering, well. What happened in 1909, and and I sort of felt like Weston was almost like the, the John Henry story, the last of the great walkers. And uh, New York Times referred to it as the first the first bona fide walk across the United States. The first one was documented from end to end, um, but it was really the last of the last of the, the dinosaurs. And I think that that's why when people started coming out and why I sort of felt there's a bigger story here about what has changed. I started researching and find out why how many miles a, a day people might have walked back uh, in 1900, 1850, 1800. Not that much research on that. So I had to do a, use some proxies on that, try to figure out what was happening uh, at the time. And then there are more figures on how much contemporary Americans and others walk uh, per day. So it's sort of interested to find out what was happening. It looks like we're walking uh, half or less than what we, used to do. I think that some of the more interesting research was uh, sort of reverse engineering how much we walk by just like, how is the body designed to consume calories per steps and sort of figure out what it was that we were doing back then. Generally, it looks like we were probably engineered through evolution to walk eight to 12 miles a day. And the average American uh, today is walking somewhere around two and a half miles a day. So, and back, the question is, what were they walking back in 1900? 1909, and I think it's probably closer to that, uh, probably closer to eight miles a day, just because we didn't have those forms of transportation. We didn't have, uh, this horseback was around, but not used that. It appears in all the Western movies, but and there was a lot of carriages and the like, but people still walked uh, pretty prolifically back then. So right. start, what's the change been? And you know, what's, has this affected our health? Has this affected our bodies? I became fascinated by thinking, once I started reading about the evolution, realizing that our minds evolved in, in step with our, our ability to walk, our bipedalism, that there's, there's a link between walking and our minds that I think is still pretty dimly understood and wanted to explore that. And then also how the landscape has changed, especially in the last 20 years or so, or more than the last, last half century, to accommodate cars. Everything's for cars. And yeah. So that it's sort of a downward spiral that we're walking less because walking is a miserable experience in a lot of American <laughs> towns and cities these days. And 
And so we're going to continue to walk less. And now we're getting self-driving cars and 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 electric scooters and all these things that will make us walk less and less. And those were all things I thought were worth exploring. Yeah, yeah, so interesting. Um, there's a, a chat question. Um, what do you think about the rise of ultra marathons? And what do you, Weston, would have thought about these, you know, not just even a regular marathon, but ultra marathons where they're running fast walking for long distances at a time? I think Weston would have thought, Oh, those again? I think he would have thought them pretty much the same as the uh, six-day go-as-you-please races. Of course, those were on tracks, and the ultra marathons tend to be through extreme environments. He he probably would have approved of them, I would think. Uh, I don't have much of an opinion on them. I don't know that much about them. All the time I really hear about them is when there's deaths. What was it? There's one that was just what five or six people just died on one recently in the last month. Yes. Yeah. 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 I remember hearing about that. Yeah. From um, uh, heat. Um, I think it was overheating, right? Yeah, that, Dehydration that in and overheating. In China? Yes. It was in Asia. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think China. Mm. Um, so I, I, I don't know that much about ultra marathons. I, I'm, it's like plenty of other things. I think who does this and why, <laughs> because it's yeah. too extreme. Um, but I, I understand people like to push themselves to the to the limits and and see mm -hmm. what's possible. And uh, I think Weston would have approved of them, and he probably would have competed and maybe wore his heavy boots and when he did it. Uh, <laughs> you uh, know, the next, okay, yeah. I was doing the other question there. Oh uh, yeah, no, so I was actually going to say. Um, in, when I, for my 40th birthday, I really, really, really wanted to walk the Camino to Santiago, uh, northern Spain. And uh, unfortunately, the gal that I was going to do it with became pregnant with twins. And there, there it goes. We didn't do it. So, um, but that to me is a route, like uh, what Caitlin's asking, are there any routes that one could walk across the United States? I know you said the one Weston took is not, is no longer possible. I don't right. know of any other than the Appalachian Trail, which goes north to south. Are there any that go west there is, east? There is one that uh, a guy named, uh, a couple named Eric Seaborg and Ellen Dudley pioneered, I think in the late 90s, called the American Coast Trail, or Coast to Coast Trail maybe. They walked the whole way and tried to link existing trails and then tried to link where they couldn't find existing trails that tried to find back roads that were you know, more Safe. reasonable for walking on. Uh, you know, even Weston didn't have a trail that he could walk on. He made it to Chicago on back roads, and even then the back roads petered out. He had to follow railroad tracks uh, almost all the rest of the way to San Francisco. So it's it, it, that's not feasible. But I think that that one, I can't remember what the name of it is. Um, let me just have a quick look here. Uh, It's called the American Discovery Trail. That's what it was called. 4,835 miles. Uh, I, I don't know how that has uh, held up since they first did it, which I think was in the mid to late 90s. So uh, I'm not sure if it's still, they, they formed an organization that was, the idea was to help promote and maintain it and put signs up for it, maybe establish campsites along the way. I don't know what's come of it. I have not followed uh, that, but it's uh, it'd be worth checking out. So the American Discovery Trail. I do think I read something recently. There was another one that was being established. So there's definitely demand for it. Problem yeah. is, you yeah, got the Midwest, which is not high. You know, people want to go hike the mountain ranges. <laughs> Right, right. Walking, the appeal. The, the, walking yeah. from, from Utah across to the Appalachians is a it's a lot of roll, rolling hills at best. So it's right, right, right. And and weather that's yeah unknown and sporadic. Yeah. Well, I think so, the topography sort of conspires against the coast to coast trail, but it can be done. There's also that led me to a question about the you know somebody could say, well, I walk eight to twelve miles on a treadmill versus I walk outside. And to me, it's not even the same kind of thing. What are your thoughts on that? Because what I understood from this was also that the environment, the landscape, again, all those things you talked about, about the land and the feedback that we're getting to our senses from that, as opposed to just walking on a treadmill. Do you have any thoughts about the differences? 
Yeah, I think that uh, as far as physiological impact goes, there's probably less. I mean, you're getting, if you're stepping up and down curbs and steps and going up slight hills and coming down hills, you're working different muscle groups and all, as opposed to just doing the same thing on a treadmill, even you know, one that automatically goes up or down to simulate inclines. But um, so I think physiologically, it's not that big a difference um, between treadmill walking, but psychologically, I think there is. I know there's been studies on creativity. Um, they've asked, there's a test for creativity that where they ask you to, to fill out um, some answers and questions and come up with as many answers to you know, things that whoever comes up with the most answers as well as the most unique answers uh, scores higher on the creativity test. And there's been a programs at universities where they tested students who were on treadmills. Uh, they did treadmills. They were just in a room with a blank wall. They did treadmills where there was a screen where they sort of simulated walking through the countryside. And then they had people actually go out and walk through the countryside and take the creativity tests before and after. And they found that the uh, walking outside in an actual environment uh, boosted creativity uh, fairly significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, the people mm -hmm. much better on those tests. So I, I have never been a treadmill person. I just don't. It's not me. Me neither. Yeah. It's <laughs> me nuts. Uh, I, I just don't understand it. Why? I see when I'm out on my walks, I walk by, you know, health clubs and see people just standing behind the plate glass windows walking on a, on a treadmill. I'm like, what are you doing there? Uh, you'd be outside <laughs> seeing things, meeting people, noticing things that you, in your neighborhood that you've never seen before. Uh, come back with all the stimulus. There's, you know, just your, your mind walking is great for just letting your mind roam and if you have all sorts mm -hmm. of things just to provoke it as opposed to oh my god that guy over there's really sweaty um <laughs> and i think that, that that's a plus and yeah. it's, it's helpful to to just situate yourself in your own life yeah yeah and i even find with walking i see so many people walking with their airpods and their music and they're this and they're that or they're audible and i don't know for me i'm on that all day long i just need to be listening to the sounds around me and maybe chatting with somebody that i don't get the time to actually talk to so the other stuff just feels like another distraction that walking shouldn't really be right yeah although yeah. i i listen to a lot of books on tape when i'm walking when you're walking yeah it is it's certainly efficient <laughs> that's for sure very efficient i like doing double duty and also i like depending on the book it, it sort of interacts with the environment that you're looking at. So you, mm -hmm. you have you're, you're, all these ideas are in your head and then you look up and notice something and it sort of has a duet with the ideas in your head. And I sort of enjoy that aspect of it as well. Um, now, do you feel that there's been a, a, a kind of, you said a resurgence maybe in the concepts of walking? I know biking at one point, biking seemed like it had an upswing. Everybody had a bike and was going to bike to work and bike, bike, bike. And I don't know if I really see that so much anymore. Do you feel like there is a resurgence, especially maybe in the more urban city areas of walking? Oh, I think so. No. I think definitely biking in, in more urban areas. Um, you don't think Providence has got a higher biking? You got walking, bike biking. Lane. Yeah, yeah, we do. We have a lot of biking and walking. Yeah, I, you know, again, I think it's so seasonal in some of these states, yeah. like, like mine, where now it's like <laughs> uh, from now until probably April, it's downhill. But um yeah, I feel like they're trying. I don't know how many people are actually taking use of it, but I do feel like that people are trying to create an environment that is conducive to that. You know, yeah. do you see that across the board for the most part, or do you feel like it's? I do. I think I think it's happening everywhere. I think it's a lot of it's generational. I think you've got a lot mm -hmm. of um, uh, Gen Xers and Millennials who just don't like driving. Uh, they grew up mm -hmm. sitting in the back seat, waiting for their one of their parents to make a left hand turn into the mall for two. <laughs> traffic light cycle <laughs> and realized, wow, this is really not how I want to live. And mm -hmm. they've, uh, they've, they've sort of taken up more with walking. I've got my, I've got nine nieces and nephews over the age of all in driving age. I think all, maybe four or five of them have licenses and the others just like, ah, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. I can, I, there's Uber, I can bike. I, can I would walk. like to think that maybe climate change issues have also sparked yeah. interest in being more, you know, less like, using of the I, automobiles. I would like to think that too. I'm not sure if that's the case. But <laughs> I know. <laughs> like see hopeful. Some in that. Yeah, it is hopeful. But no, I think uh, seeing a lot more interest with walking. I mean, you look at 
if you if you said ten thousand steps to somebody ten years ago, they just stare at you blankly. Now everyone's like, oh no, I did eight thousand yesterday, and everyone between the Fitbits and now with the Apple Watches yes. and just the apps and the the accelerometers and all the phones that can track how many steps you've done, people seem to be attuned to it a little bit more. Um, now we're sort of into the backlash about the ten thousand steps. Uh, as doctors point out, that it's not really a magic number. It just comes from the Japanese word um, that meant 10,000 steps because it had a good sound and somebody named a pedometer after that in the 1950s oh. or 60s, I think it was. And then it somehow jumped over to the US 10 or 20 years later and everyone decided 10,000 steps was the magic number. But it just relates to, I think the word is manko pei in, uh, in Japanese, if I'm, if I'm remembering right which means 10,000 steps, which was the name of a pedometer company. <laughs> so that's oh, wow. where, where it came from. But 10,000 steps is about, about five miles, about twice what the average American does. So it's it's a good target. I've, my target, I've got, got one of these Withings watches that has the dial that's built in that track, track 10,000 steps every day. So I can always glance down and see how I'm doing today. Not so good, about 33,000 <laughs> steps. Um, but it's, uh, I think people are more attuned to it. Um, yeah. The Fitbit, Fitbit really sort of took off, then it sort of faded, but I think that the Apple Watches and the other wearable devices are sort of picking up the slack from where that might've left off. So, yeah, yeah, the Fitbit didn't have quite enough stuff to it, <laughs> I guess. No, not enough toys. And it, it looks sort of utilitarian. It didn't look, yeah. well, they tried to make it fancy, but weren't very successful. Yeah, it wasn't enough, yeah. So Caitlin here wrote that, um, oh yeah, Caitlin, the blue bikes or the city bikes, well, and even in my in Providence, they have a lot of those scooters, like electric scooters. Oh, yeah. um, so more walking and biking or some kind of an electric type of mobility. And the, the bike share programs that seem to have done well pretty much everywhere they've appeared. And, and that's a great thing. And at the very least, it gets people off the streets. I think electric bikes are great things. So people... A lot of people go, oh, I don't like electric bikes. They're more expensive than regular bikes and they don't take as, you know, I don't get as good exercise. So I think, well, you shouldn't be comparing an electric bike to a bike. You should be comparing it to a car. Right. And that's what they're sort of used for to get around. They're very efficient for that. And, and it takes another car off the road. And it's, I think, electric right. bike is great. And a lot of the blue bike programs are now electric. New Orleans has switched over to electric. Here in Denver, they're electric. Um, so I think that's a good thing. And again, yeah. I don't see I don't see electric bikes as competing with bikes, but more as with cars and even with mass transportation with, with transit. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. Right. Um, Vivian wrote, oh, this is sweet, Vivian. There's a man who walks constantly around the town where she used to live, and he was a bit mentally handicapped, and walking was the thing that kept his brain calm and that it was sort of beautiful. And I I can totally see that. Like you can envision that being a calming thing for somebody who might not have other things for him. Yeah, I think there's a there's a history of of people walking uh, who had some sort of mental illness or another, and they would go. There's there's great accounts of, of towns in Ohio where somebody would walk in from from Boston or something, and it, sometimes he might have a vision or uh, trying to find acolytes, but they would just keep walking and walking and walking. Like probably Johnny Appleseed. Might, might yeah. Be fit into that category um, according to some accounts so it's it's I think there is a connection between mental health and walking both for, mm -hmm. as a as a salve and as a palliative as well as to help uh, eat those who even have uh, good solid mental skills to keep them longer in life as they mm -hmm. age mm -hmm. um, and this actually kind of leads into that where people during this time going back to the early 1900s um, thinking of walking as fitness or was fitness not really a concern? I mean, I'm sure it wasn't a, a talked about like it is today, but was it was it in those in that vein? Well, there, there was I mean, there's fitness there were the medicine balls and and the, that was all I think that came out of the sporting sporting life, the gyms, the boxing gyms. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I think that was a, a thing in the late 1900s. Walking, I don't think was as much part of that uh, mm -hmm. because everyone walked. So it was sort of a, a uh, it was just a standard thing. You didn't have to, it didn't have to be a separate thing that was related to fitness. Uh, it mm -hmm. was just something that you did. Uh, the walking competitions, was, that was more something to bet on than I think it was to show people's prowess for being fit. Weston seemed to understand that there's a fitness component to it, at least later. And used to preach about that quite a bit when he 
gave his talk. So he would he would walk his 35, 40, sometimes 70 miles a day, and show up in a town in the evening, walk right to an auditorium and get up on a stage and give a 45 minute or an hour lecture on the benefits of walking. Um, how we did that. Yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> but, uh, I don't think I don't think walking was as um, as, as, as was considered necessarily as much fitness because people just didn't pay that much attention to it. Fitness was something you would do at, at a boxing gym uh, or something like that. So I see Caitlin mentioned Tom Hanks and uh, yeah. that uh, Garp. yeah, and then the uh, Forrest Gump. With yes. constant walking, walking, walking. Yeah, there's another connection between mental health and walking. Um, and I don't know how much you know about Pilates, but Pilates, which kind of brought us to this whole thing in the first place, um, wanted to be a boxer. And so early 1900s, wanted to be in boxing, a lot of betting with the boxing, which I wouldn't have really even thought about where the betting came from and all of that. But um, again, looking at it as more physical health and well-being and preventive medicine than necessarily I think the way we see fitness today so it feels like it all kind of segues into yeah the same place I don't, you know? I don't know about Pilates that's interesting to me that it started with with boxing yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so he wanted to be a boxer and lo and behold it took a different path but I mean, actually, Vivian just wrote in Pilates we start with what we call footwork that's to bring the mind and body together working the points of our feet and there's an exercise called running which is kind of like prancing but there's exercises to almost stimulate the functionality of walking hmm. and how it does all come together so yeah. you know while they seem like separate entities they really are in the same they have the same place okay. very cool um yeah. wayne i know you had some pictures and oh Pilates used to, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Navi wrote, Pilates used to run around Manhattan every day. He did. In fact, he was in his tidy whities So Wayne, <laughs> Joe Pilates, that Pilates is named after, ran around New York City with just his boxer brief song in uh, the cold. So <laughs> he agreed with that too. Um, Wayne, I know you had a few photos and a short clip. Can you show some of that? Yeah, the uh, the clip was, well, the, I'll, be get, I'll be get the, um, the photos. This this was uh this is Weston. I think not sure the date on this. Uh, probably around around the time of his walk, 1909, 1910. Hmm. Um, here's a shot of him. This is in Minneapolis. This is him right in the center in the white shirt or center of the crowd. Everyone sort of gawking at him as he was walking through one of his later walks, 1913 afterwards. This was, uh, I believe, coming into Chicago. And this was interesting to see. He was terrified of crowds coming in and stepping on his feet. He could barely make out a white line uh, around that. He had a group of men form a circle with a rope that preceded him. So he was in the center of that that uh, that white line that to keep the crowd back. He had cops and on uh, horses up front. He had a support car behind. Probably that car to the lower right of him is uh, probably VIPs of some sort. Or just, out accompanying him along there, uh, pretty intriguing uh, celebrity at, at the, of the time. This is a uh, map of his route. Not he could have done it in a hundred days. I, one of the things I had to figure out was why, when he left New York, did he go up to Albany before he made a left? Why would he just go across the Hudson and continue on from there? He probably could have done it, sh shaved off his five days there. But uh, at first, I thought because it said elsewhere that he he. Uh, didn't like to cross bridges. He thought that was cheating. He wanted, or he didn't want to take ferries. He had to cross, yeah. he would cross some bridges and he'd walk across, but he wouldn't take a boat across. And I thought Albany was the first one up there. Then I came to learn that there was the bridge in Poughkeepsie was open and the railroad bridge there probably in 1880s. So he could have gone left of Poughkeepsie. But I think what it was is he did a lot of, of walks across New York State from, uh, from Boston, from Portland, Chicago off in the destination. I think he just, went, I think it was, it was sentimental. And I think he knew he had a lot of support there that he would get free hotel rooms. People would bring him out meals and bring him, there'd be crowds. I think he wanted the attention is my guess why he went up. And then uh, he had a support car as far as Chicago. And then uh, the support car dropped out because of some disputes over financials. 
And uh, so he was on his own from Chicago the rest of the way. And as I mentioned earlier, he did that mostly on the railroad tracks, uh, following along there. And he had the railroad company cooperated with him. He could drop his 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 luggage, his bag off with a rail depot and just put a note on it where he wanted it delivered. And, and 30, 40 miles up the road, they'd just drop it off at the depot there and he would pick it up so he could mm. keep supplied that way. Also, they, they brought him ice and water along the track. They'd slow down and th toss it out to him. So he had that. And then the, the clip that I had, which fascinates me, and this was from 1909. Um, this, right, this was just a few days before the so 1909, before the San Francisco earthquake, 1906. Uh, just a few days before the earthquakes, Mark, the, uh, the market down at the water in the distance, it was just shot from the front of a cable car. And this, this fascinates me how, you know, now everyone's like, everything's sort of fixed. You, there's sidewalks for walkers. You go across yeah. it to crosswalks. Uh, if you cross it, other places you're jaywalking. The cars have the right of the road. But this was a, in an era when no one had sorted it out who had the rights to anything yet. So everybody had everything, uh, whether it was bicycles or pedestrians or horse carts or cars. And everyone just sort of wove around uh, in front of each other. And it, it seemed to work out. This is, there's a, now I, I like the bike here is fascinated by the movie camera on the front of the, the car. <laughs> and then we're just shooting across, cops, <laughs> walking by like everything's normal. Stuff for that camera in front of the thing, uh, but it's a and there's, it's sort of fascinating to me that this is how it was, and then it's really in the 1920s that the automobile industry began a very concerted effort to chase pedestrians off of the road because they wanted to go faster. At this time, 20 miles an hour was uh, was a max. Uh, the original one, original cars were, went four miles an hour, which was the speed somebody could run in front of them waving a red flag, which was required. Uh, you know, when they first came out, that was in England. But they, uh, the time, you know, the cars were still considered interlopers. If there was an accident, then uh, between a pedestrian and a car, the car owner was always arrested uh, because it was oh my God. Fault because the pedestrians, uh, it was their space, and the cars were interlopers. Uh, by night, by the 1920s, the uh, AAA clubs had started to form and lobby for the rights of cars. The, the word jaywalker was invented um, just to to make people who crossed uh, the roads not at the intersections feel like they were being idiots because jay was a jay was slang for some hick from the small town who didn't understand where he was. So they started referring to jaywalkers to make the, and urban people didn't want, want to be thought hicks from a small town, so they you know stepped up <laughs> and then you started getting in the traffic lights, the, the crosswalks. Uh, and then the uh, other thing that fascinates me is uh, something I learned about on the, in the research is the uh, edge of the road was called the verge. I guess over on the left, I can't really see it there, but where everyone parallel parks now uh, mm -hmm. and takes, takes up all this space with a uh, private property that's just used, not used 80% of the time. That was all pretty active space. Over on the right, you can start to see it. There were little markets set up there. Uh, mm -hmm. There were, it was sort of a, a liminal space between the traffic lanes and the storefronts where people could stop and sell things and congregate and socialize. Uh, and those were, that was all taken away with the cars. So it's fascinating to me in the pandemics with all of these uh, restaurants taking those spaces back. Their spaces, and, I, and I mean, a lot of people are incensed by it, but I thought, well, this is just going back to, to where we were. I think that's, that, that's quite fascinating. So that's wow. and i love that that's, i love that clip i, I do love that too yeah it's sort of it's mesmerizing chaos. to see how city life worked in 1906. vivian had written that one of her relatives was killed at seven years old by a trolley car that's awful i'm sorry to hear that vivian that is but horrible. yeah you can see how like that picture right there was kind of chaos they were just coming yeah. and going and no there's, there's something now that and and urban planning circles called the the Wooners, which is a Dutch name. And what uh, they did uh, first did in Holland, the, uh, more in England, is there was a, this treacherous intersection where there was a lot of pedestrians, a lot of cars. There were all sorts of signs, there were all sorts of lanes, there were all sorts of lights to try to control everyone's traffic um, and speed everybody through. And they this. This traffic engineer came in and they gave him such a tiny budget, he couldn't really do anything. They're like, redesign this. So he said, take everything out. He took out all the signs, all the lights. 
he, he eliminated the curbs. He made everything the same level. He said, just go through. <laughs> and it worked. And it turned out that it showed that the traffic sped up, the pedestrians sped up, and the and the uh, incidents of accidents dropped dramatically. Uh, so oh, wow. that's starting, you're starting to see that come back. I think there's an area in San Francisco that's been trying it as a pilot. Uh, it's It sounds crazy, but it works because what it comes down to is that once you exceed 20 miles an hour, so you see that 20 is plenty of movement moving across the USSO signs in Denver today for that, uh, just put 20 mile an hour limits everywhere. The studies have shown that 20 miles an hour, a driver can still make eye contact with a pedestrian. You can communicate a lot like who's going first. Whereas once you get over 20 miles an hour and you have 30 mile an hour, you, everyone's dependent on signs, stop sign, light. Nobody's like looking at each other. Everybody's just... Uh, I've got my rule book, I'm following the rules, and that's when things get into trouble and people start bending or breaking the rules. Whereas if you eliminate those, people will be conscious. As, as a driver, you pull up, you see someone, you make eye contact, just through a nod or a wave or something, you know what's, you know, who's going to do what. But once you get faster than that, you lose it. So I, I feel that 1906 clip is a sort of evidence of that as well. You can sort of see that going on at the same time. Yeah, yeah, so interesting. Cool. Um, awesome. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions um, or, or thoughts? Caitlin, I know you, Caitlin's in the city in Brookline, which is, I was there today, lots of cars everywhere, <laughs> narrow lanes and trying to navigate. And I'm sure you walk probably way more than I do. It's a very walk, Boston is a pretty walkable city, I have to say. <laughs> drivers are crazy in Boston. They are. This is true. They are. <laughs> um, true, true. Exactly. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions or thoughts or comments for Wayne today? I want to make sure I cover everything and let everybody have a chance. Elise, did you want to say something? Vivian? Okay. Uh, I just want to say uh, that clip was fascinating and thank you for sharing it. I mean, really, I never thought about the evolution of uh, traffic laws and there was a time before traffic laws. Right. So. There was, and we've all grown up to believe that you know, crossing at the crosswalk is inviolable, but it's actually take, it's taking our rights away in a lot of ways. Um, it's interesting. I, I don't get a whole lot of support on that because everybody drives. <laughs> I drive, uh, and I always want to go faster. But if, or if you if you love cities, you really need to go slower and, and uh, give up some of your space. And that's happening. But you know, I'm fascinated. Oh boy, the fights in New Orleans over the new bike lanes. Everybody's incensed when you take away a line a lane of traffic away. You're like that's just going to back up much further. And you know, in Denver here today, I was taking a car out to the distillery and they're expanding a 10 lane highway to 14 lanes. And there's the, um, you know, the indu whole induced demand argument which seems to be gaining among younger urban planners that you, if you add lanes, you reduce congestion for maybe two or four years. And then everyone starts to build out there because it's quicker and then it becomes, then you have to widen it again. And it's like, yeah. People seem to be understanding that a little bit better in some places now that why you can't widen your way out of congestion. You have to come up with either mass transit or more high density housing. My my Uber driver today back here was incensed by all of the multifamily places. And he, he seemed to be under the impression that the federal government had banned single family homes across the country. I thought it was a discussion best not to get into with him. So <laughs> yeah. Good I idea. Know, but uh <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's a lot happening. Mm. <laughs> I think about um, you know they, uh, uh, Vivian and Kaylin had written about being international and how so much of the cities in Europe there's so much more walking I feel like or outdoor biking and walking than there is here. I know Denmark is bikes, bikes, bikes everywhere. Yeah. All and, through the world. You know, yeah, Spain and Italy they walk, walk, but you know. I, even here, however, being a little bit more, um, I guess I'm suburban than urban, it is hard. You can't get from point A to point B very quickly and it's just not convenient. And that's kind of sad because it affects everything from our physical health. I know you talked about obesity is on the rise physically, 
Um, I keep thinking about getting sucked up, but I keep picturing when I saw that sentence about a big bean bag just like enveloping me and I'm sucked into my bean bag chair. Uh, but you know, it does how it affects everything. And so, just like um, Elise just said, we didn't think about traffic laws before this. We don't think about what not walking is doing right. to us over the long haul, you know? So I thought it was so insightful. Yeah, it made, made me think on so many levels, you know? It's true about Europe, but it, 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 East Coast versus West Coast. The West Coast developed on the automotive template, except for you know downtown San Francisco, downtown Seattle, a handful of places. But everything outside of that was built around the convenience of the car, whereas all up and down the Eastern Seaboard, you know, started being developed in the 1700s. It's all built around walking, and the, mm -hmm. the they get to the outer, the edge communities, and there they have alleys. It's like okay, we acknowledge that there are cars, and you use yeah. an alley with a parking garage in the back. That lasted for maybe 20 years as a you know sort of a development preference. And then it was just like, oh the hell with it. We we want bigger backyards with the park and driveways and we'll take the space out front. So once you start doing that, and then people want bigger lots and right. it becomes harder to walk. There's a certain level of density that encourages walking. And once you get beyond that, it becomes aesthetically unattractive and, and just too too long. Yeah. Well, and at this point, too dangerous. Everybody's driving with yeah. their cars and their cell phones in their car and it, you know, I, I find it scary. I, I always am very much on the alert. I would never walk at night like Pace and uh, like um, Weston did because it would be dangerous, you know? So yeah. that's kind of sad that it kind yeah. of Well, when he was walking, I probably very few cars out at night. So. Yeah, yeah. Definitely not with cell phones. <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Wayne, for taking the time out of your day to have this conversation with us. It was really um, insightful and enjoy it. And I enjoyed it very much. I, I loved reading the book. Um, I got a lot out of it and that made me think and have conversations with others that I might not have talked about these topics. So I appreciate that. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite and uh, good luck with your book club and your future thing sounds great thank really you good. thank you and when you write something about whiskey we'll be i don't i don't not a fan of the whiskey but we'll i'll definitely be interested in seeing what you have to say <laughs> we have to. and i think uh, joe used to drink what what was he what did he used to drink joe pilates um wasn't he a whiskey drinker i think it was whiskey right i think so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank I you think that he downed really quite a bit of it <laughs> really interesting really yeah. nice thanks for the invite good luck have a thank good you. week